Hello, welcome to Vaulted Cross. My name is Irenaeus, and uh, this is going to be one of my first videos. I um, decided to make a channel looking at basically life in general through the lens of a recovering alcoholic and a convert to Orthodox Christianity. Um, my background is that I wandered aimlessly through life, uh, led around by my passions, um, till I experienced enough pain to repent and to uh, to pray for direction from God, and I received it. And uh, so, this is something that I thought I would try for fun. Uh, this is mainly for me to, to also learn, um, so I'm just picking a topic tonight, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. I just thought I would do a quick um, rundown of his life and see if we could get to know the guy a little bit better. So um, hopefully this is useful to anybody else who is also interested. So I have a few sources pulled up and we might as well go ahead and jump in. Since I do have the microphone turned on this time, that's great. Okay, over here on Orthodox Wiki, I have Eusebius of Caesarea, who was the Bishop of Caesarea in Palestine during the early 4th century. He was a prominent personality during the period when Christianity was recognized by Constantine the Great, ending the persecutions, and he participated in the First Council of Nicaea. He is famous for his writings, particularly his church history or ecclesiastical history. He's often referred to as Eusebius Pamphili because of his close friendship with Pamphilus, Pamphilius, the founder of the major library in Caesarea. So I have a, uh, I have a map here just uh, so we can take a look. 
I, for me, I'm a visual learner, so uh, for me to keep things in my head, it helps for me to have uh, something to remember visually. And so if that helps you, that's kind of why I'm doing this thing as well. You see here, Caesarea, Caesarea of Philippi is at the top here next to Tyre. Uh, this is a Herodian map, so a little bit older than the uh, time frame that we were, were currently exploring. Uh, I did want to do a timeline rundown so that we have a little bit of context uh, for what's going on. Around uh, in before the time of this, you know, church father, it seems like they don't necessarily think of the Eusebius too uh, greatly. Um, there is definitely some some uh, questionable things that he was involved in, uh, you know. So I have definitely no references to being a saint, um, but very interested in time period, inter interesting time period. So. Um, you know, I thought I'd run through anti-Nicene era, uh, 100 to 325. So that takes us up right to the time of Constantine. And, uh, you know, the relaxation or the acceptance of the Christianity in the Roman Empire. So, you know, just real quick before that, we have obviously the uh, 70 AD Temple of Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans, expulsion of Christians from synagogues. That's obviously a very important part of this, uh, of church history. And, you know, just for context, 70 AD, 90 AD, we have, uh, let's see, 90 to 96 persecution of Christians under Emperor Domitian. A lot of me, I don't want to go through all of this, but I do want to hit on like persecution and martyrdom because uh, it sets the tone for the uh, few hundred years up until uh, the time of Constantine the Great and the uh, Council, the first Council of Nicaea. So, you know, martyrdom of Ignatius, persecution under Emperor Trajan from 108 to 124. Few more martyrs in here. Beginning of Montanism. Persecution under Emperor Marcus Marcus Aurelius uh, from 177 to 180 AD. Of course, I got to point out the uh, martyrdom of Irenaeus of Lyons. That's my uh, patron saint. Persecution under Emperor Septimius, Septimius Severus from 202 to 210. There's a martyrdom there. There's a Tertullian. Marcus Aurelius, 177 to 180. That was before Septimius Severus, 202 to 210. Origin in here, persecution under Emperor Maximinius Thrax. Persecution, oh wait, that was from 235 to 238, 249 to 251. Persecution under Emperor Decius. 257 to 260 AD, persecution under Emperor Valerian. Martyrdom, martyrdom of Cyprian of Carthage. Persecution under Emperor Aurelian, 274 to 275. 284, Diocletian becomes Roman Emperor, persecutes church and martyrs, an estimated 1 million Christians. Martyrdom of Cosmos and Damian. Uh, Andrew Stratolites, the general, and 2,593 soldiers with him in Cilicia. 
Christian population and 300 reaches 6,200,000 or 10.5% of the population in the Roman Empire. 302, 20,000 martyrs burned in Nicomedia. 303, outbreak of the Great Persecution. 303 to 311, martyrdom of George the Trophy Bearer. Marcellius opposes leniency for Christians who lapsed under persecution. That's a little bit different than... Uh, 313, the Edict of Milan issued by Constantine the Great. So 312, we have Constantine the Great on the scene. Constantine on the scene. Defeat of Maxim, Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. Makes him the Emperor of the West. And there we are, 324, 325, First Ecumenical Council held in Nicaea, condemning Arianism. This is this is very big thing happening at this time. Uh, I'll also be issuing the first version of the Nicene Creed, uh, which Eusebius does play a part in. So. Um, Let's go back here. There's a picture of our dude Eusebius. Obviously, they did not call him father or saint. Who has been called the father of church history? Little is known of Eusebius' youth. He was probably born around 260 AD, though the exact date and place are not certain. He may have come from a family of some influences. He was released after a short imprisonment during the Diocletian's persecutions. Persecutions in which his friend Pamphilius and other companions were martyred. Eusebius was acquainted with the priest Dorotheus in Antioch, who may have been have given him exegetical instruction. By 296, he was in Palestine, where he first saw Constantine the, when Constantine visited Palestine with Diocletian. Eusebius was in Caesarea when Agapius was its bishop. His friendship with Pamphilius of Caesarea was a close one. With him, he studied Holy Scripture using as an aid Origins, Hexapla, and other commentaries that Pamphilus had collected in his library. Origin is another uh, important part to get into, but I don't really want to dive into it much here. Um, He was a priest ordained under controversial conditions. Citation needed. His writings were extensive, much of which is not extant. In later centuries, some extreme views by followers were attained to him, and his name was brought under suspicion. He was anathematized by the Second Council of Constantinople in 553, especially, specifically in its 11th canon. So their friendship, his friendship with Pamphilius was uh, cut short when he was, Pamphilius was arrested in 307 and martyred in 309. It is assumed as the persecutions relaxed that Eusebius succeeded Pamphilius as head of his school and may have been ordained to the priesthood during this time. He was already consecrated a bishop by 315 when he took part in the dedication of a new basilica in Tyre. He had succeeded Agapius as bishop of Caesarea Palestinia. The next that is known of Eusebius is when he participated as a prominent member in the Council of Nicaea.
First Ecumenical Council was held in Nicaea in AD 325 and set a pattern for all later ecumenical councils. It primarily addressed the issue of Arianism, producing the original version of the Nicene Creed and set a universal pattern for calculating the date of Pascha or Pascalian. It is also referred to as the First Council of Nicaea. Hoseus of Cordoba, which condemned Arianism and its followers, even explicitly naming Eusebius of Caesarea, who is believed to have waffled somewhat on the question. When Constantine convened the council at Nicaea, he did so primarily out of a desire to have an ununified, a unified empire rather than an attempt to affect church doctrine. Eusebius of Nicomedia first submits an Arian creed for the delegates to consider, and it is rejected immediately. Eusebius of Caesarea then submits a baptismal creed native to the Palestine to Palestine for consideration. It is this latter creed that many historians regard as being the essential framework for the Nicene Creed, though many also regard the creed issued at the earlier Antiochian Council to be the basis for the Nicene Creed, Nicaea's Creed. The Palestinian Creed had included the biblical phrase, firstborn of all creation, in its description of Christ, but the phrase does not appear in the Nicene Creed, probably because taken out of its context in the Apostle Paul's letter to Colossians, Colossians it could be interpreted in an Arian manner. The phrase gets replaced with the famous Homo Usius, a philosophical term meaning that the Son of God is of one essence with the Father. Eusebius was involved in the Arian controversies. For instance, he disputed with Eustathius of Antioch, who opposed the growing influence of origin and his practice of an allegorical exegesis of scripture and saw in origins the theology the roots of Arianism. Eusebius, an admirer of origin, was reproached by Eustathius for deviating from the Nicene faith. Eustathius, in turn, was charged with Sabellianism. Eustathius was accused, condemned, and deposed at a council in Antioch. While the people of Antioch rebelled against this action and the anti-Eustathians Proposed Eusebius as the new bishop, but he declined. After Eustathius had been deposed, the Eusebians proceeded against Athanasius of Alexandria, a much more dangerous opponent. In 334, Athanasius was summoned before a council in Caesarea, which he did not attend. The following year, he was again summoned before a council in Tyre, at which Eusebius presided. Athanasius, foreseeing the result, went to Constantinople to bring his cause before the emperor. Constantine called the bishops to his court, among them Eusebius. However, Athanasius was condemned and exiled at the end of 335. The same council, another opponent, was successfully attacked. Marcellius of Ancria had long opposed the Eusebians and had protested against the reinstitution of Arius. He was accused of Sabellianism and deposed in 336. Constantine died the next year, and Eusebius did not long survive him. Eusebius had died probably at Caesarea by 340 at the latest, but probably on May 30th, 339. So I had to take a look at what the Catholics had to say. No. Towards the end of 307, Pamphilius was arrested, horribly tortured, and consigned to prison. Besides continuing, continuing his work of edit, editing the Septuagint, he wrote, in collaboration with Eusebius, a defense of origin, which was sent to the confessors in the mines. A wonderful gift from a man whose sides had been curried with iron combs. 
to men with their right eyes burned out and the sinews of their left legs cauterized. That's an interesting sentence. Early in 309, Pamphilius and several of his disciples were beheaded. Out of devotion to his memory, Eusebius called himself Eusebius Pamphili, meaning probably that he wished to be regarded as the bondsman of him whose name, quote, it is not meet that I should mention without styling him my lord, end quote. During the persecution, Eusebius visited Tyre and Egypt and witnessed a number of martyrdoms. Church History, Volume 7. Church, Church History, 7 to 9. He certainly did not shun danger and was at one time a prisoner. When, where, or how he escaped death or any kind of mutilation, we do not know. An indignant bishop who had been one of his fellow prisoners and lost an eye for the truth, quote, lost an eye for the truth, demanded at the Council of Tyre how, quote, he came off scatheless. To this taunt, it was hardly a question made under circumstances of great provocation. Eusebius deigned no reply. He had many enemies, yet the charge of cowardice was never seriously made, the best proof that it could not have been sustained. We may assume that as soon as the persecution began to relax, Eusebius succeeded Pamphilius in the charge of the college and library. Perhaps he was ordained priest about this time. Let's see, Alexander Bishop. Of The Arians soon found that for all practical purposes, Eusebius was on their side. He wrote to Alexander, charging him with misrepresenting the teaching of the Arians and so giving them cause to, quote, attack and misrepresent whatever they please, unquote. A portion of this letter has been preserved in the Acts of the Second Council of Nicaea, where it is it was cited to prove that Eusebius was a heretic. He also took part in a synod of Syrian bishops who decided that Arius should be restored to his former position. But on his side, he was to obey his bishop and continually entreat peace and communion with him. At the opening of the Council of Nicaea, Eusebius occupied the first seat at on the right hand of the emperor and delivered the inaugural address, which was couched, quote, couched in a strain of thanksgiving to Almighty God on his, the emperor's behalf, unquote. He uh, evidently enjoyed great prestige and many may not unreasonably have been expected to be able to steer the council through the via media between the Scylla, Scylla, Scylla? and Chardy of yes and no. But if he entertained such hopes, they were soon disappointed. We have already spoken of the profession of faith, which he brought forward to vindicate his own orthodoxy, or perhaps in the hope that the council might adopt it. It was in view of the actual state of the controversy, a colorless, or what at the present day would be called a comprehensive formula. After some delay, Eusebius subscribed to the uncompromising creed drawn up by the council, making no secret in the letter which he wrote to his own church of the non-natural sense in which he accepted it. Between 325 and 330, he, a heated controversy took place between Eusebius and Eustathius, Eustathius, Bishop of Antioch. Eustathius accused Eusebius of tampering with the faith of Nicaea. The latter reported with the charge of Sibelianism. In 331, Eusebius was among the bishops who at a synod held in Antioch opposed Eustathius. He was offered and refused the vacancy. See, 337, Constantine died. Eusebius served him long enough to write his life in two treaties against Marcellus. 
but by the summer of 341 he was already dead, since it was his successor, Acacius, who assisted as bishop of Caesarea at the synod held at Antioch in the summer of that year. I don't feel like that sentence computes. Anyways. So, I have this book. I've got part of it on a PDF here. This is a picture of ancient Caesarea looking toward the southeast. Herod the Great constructed the city in the year 25 to 13 BC, including this semicircular seawall opening to the north. A uh, picture by George Beatty. So this has just got a little bit of a couple pages here, the life of Eusebius. I'm sure it's going to say a lot of the similar things there. Eusebius in Greek means one who is reverent, pious, or devout, a proper name, nearly equivalent to pious in Latin. That was shared by a half dozen other famed figures in Christian history. A geographical suffix distinguishes them from one another. Just as Jesus of Nazareth differentiated him from the 20 other Jesuses in biblical times, so Eusebius of Caesarea designates the church historian. Although there were also a number of Caesareas in antiquity, all named in honor of Augustus, Augustus, the first Roman emperor, Eusebius, is, is Caesarea. Maritima, the famous city of Palestine, constructed by Herod the Great on the Mediterranean shore at a site previously called Sprato's Tower. This Caesarea is mentioned frequently in the New Testament as the Roman capital of Judea, the headquarters of Pontius Pilate, Cornelius, Herod, Agrippa, Felix, and Festus as well as the place where Paul was imprisoned for two years. Here, too, the riot broke out in A.D. 66 that led to the great Jewish war against Rome and the destruction of Jerusalem. The last only enhanced the importance of Caesarea, and by the 3rd century it was virtually the capital of Syria, a very large cosmopolitan city with a Jewish, Greek, Samaritan, and Christian populace. Eusebius was probably born around 260. His biography written by Acacius, his successor as Bishop of Caesarea, has not survived to provide more exact detail. His ancestry and the story of his youth are unknown. His education may be adduced from the fact that the great Eastern scholar theologian Origen spent his later years in Caesarea, Dying several years before Eusebius was born, Origen's influence persisted strongly in the theological school founded there by the learned Pamphilus. Didn't they put an extra I in that last time? Presbyter in the church at Caesarea, who taught Eusebius and influenced him most. Eusebius joined Pamphilus in writing a defense of Origen, made use of his great library, and wrote a life of Pamphilus, now lost whom he valued so highly that he was often known as Eusebius Pamphili. In the final great persecution of the Christians under Diocletian, Pamphilius was imprisoned and martyred in 310. Upon the death of his mentor, Eusebius went to Tyre in Phoenicia and Alexandria in Egypt, where he was imprisoned in the Diocletian persecution, but released shortly afterward, many years later, an opponent accused him of having gained his release by pagan sacrifice, but no evidence for this was adduced at the time or since. Had such evidence existed, it surely would have been used in the theological turmoil of the day just after Constantine's Edict of Toleration was issued in 313. Eusebius was elected Bishop of Caesarea, where he remained until his death, despite being offered and declining the part Patriarchate of Antioch in 331. About 316, he gave the dedicatory address at the new cathedral in Tyre, which he published in Book 10 of his church history. Two years later, the Arian controversy exploded in Eastern Christendom, and Eusebius soon found himself embroiled in it. 
he favored a med mediating position between the theological extremes of Arius, Presbyter, and Alexandria. Quote, Jesus is more than a man, but less than God, who existed before the Son, end quote, and Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria. Quote, Jesus is God of the same essence and co-eternal with the Father, end quote. Although Eusebius did not endorse the full subordinationism, of Arius, he was somewhat sympathetic to the Arian cause, for which the Council of Antioch provisionally excommunicated him and two others in 324. His case, however, was transferred to the Great Council of Nicaea the following year, where he sat at Constantine's right hand and served as a prominent theological advisor, delivering a panegyric in honor of the emperor. Oh, they don't have the other picture in here. Okay. Well, I guess it pays to have the hardcover. All right. Uh, there's a picture here, a section of the Roman wall at Nicaea in Asia Minor, where Eusebius advised the Emperor Constantine at the Great Council in AD 325. Uh, too bad I can't really show you that. So, as, a, as leader of the moderate party at the council, Eusebius presented the creed used by his church at Caesarea and was exonerated of any her heresy. Constantine stated that the creed reflected his own views, and it seems to have served as basis for that adopted at Nicaea, but this creed was adopted only after important addenda had been made by the Alexandrian party, including Jesus being defined as homoousius, quote, of one substance or essence, with the Father. Although Eusebius finally voted with the overwhelming majority for what would merge as the Nicene Creed, he wrote a letter to his church explaining his hesitations and voicing concerns that the Alexandrian party was verging on Sabellianism, a heresy that claimed unity over Trinity, i.e. that the Son of God was only God acting in a saving mode or capacity. Uh, this concern followed Eusebius to the Council of Antioch in 331, which deposed Eustathius, a leading anti-Arian, and to the Synod at Constantinople in 336, which condemned Marcellius, Bishop of Ancria, Ancyra, Ankara, modern. For extreme anti-Arianism, this does not, however, mean that Eusebius remained a pro-Arian. Eusebius's orthodoxy later in life is confirmed by his rejection of the two cardinal principles of Arianism that were that there was a time when the Son of God was not, and that he was created out of nothing. Just after the Synod of Constantinople, Eusebius was chosen to deliver an oration on the Tricinellia of Constantine, the celebration marking his 30th year as emperor. Constantine died in the following year, 337, as Eusebius two years, and Eusebius two years after that, most probably on May 30th, 339. There's that date again, a date known with considerable certainty from the Syriac Martiology of the 4th century. Nothing is known of Eusebius's two final years other than that he published A Life of Constantine in four books, a panegyric rather than a strict history. And it goes on to talk about some of his writings, historical writings, apologetic works, polemic writings, doctrinal works, exegetical, Bible dictionaries, orations, letters. Um, I have a couple of other books here. I've got The Middle Sea, A History of the Mediterranean by John Julius Norwick. Uh, but I'm sure I can get a lot more out of um, does mention Eusebius a couple times in here. Get a little bit more context of uh, that time period. The Milvian Bridge.
This time, Constantine was in his early 30s. On his father's side, his lineage could scarcely have been more distinguished. His mother, Helena, on the other hand, far from being as the 12th century Joffrey of Monmouth and more recently Evelyn Waugh would have us believe, the daughter of Cole, mythical founder of Colchester and the old King Cole of the nursery rhyme, was almost certainly the offspring of a humble innkeeper in Bithynia. Note a Byzantine province extending from the Asiatic shore of the Bosphorus along the southern coast of the Black Sea. Other less reputable historians have gone so far as to suggest that as a girl she had been one of the supplementary amenities of her father's establishment regularly available to his clients at a small extra charge. That's horrible. Uh, only later in her life, when her son had excelled to the supreme power, did she become the most venerated woman in the empire in 327, when she was already over 70, this passionate Christian convert made her celebrated pilgrimage to the Holy Land, there miraculously to unearth the true cross and thus to gain an honorable place in the calendar of saints. But let us return to Constantine. The first thing to be said is that no ruler in all history, not Alexander, nor Alfred, nor Charles, nor Catherine, not Frederick, nor even Gregory, has ever more fully merited this title of the great. For with the short space of some 15 years, he took two decisions, either of which alone would have changed the future of the civilized world. The first was to adopt Christianity, the object only a generation previously of persecutions under Diocletian more brutal than any that is uh, that it has suffered before or since as the official religion of the Roman Empire. The second was to transfer the capital of that empire from Rome to the new city which he was building on the site of the old Greek settlement of Byzantium and which was to be known for the next 16 centuries by his own name, the city of Constantine, Constantinople. Together, these two decisions and their consequences have given him a serious claim to be considered accepting only Jesus Christ, the prophet Muhammad, and the Buddha, the most influential man who ever lived. Immediately after his acclamation, Constantine had naturally sent word to his co-Augustus, Galerius, now ruling from Nicomedia, the modern Ismit, across the Bosphorus, but Galerius, while the very reluctantly agreeing, To acknowledge him as Caesar refused to point it blank point blank to recognize him as an Augustus, having already appointed a certain Valerius Licinianus called Licinius, one of his old drinking companions. Constantine did not seem particularly worried. Perhaps he did not yet feel ready for the supreme power. At all events, he remained in Gaul and Britain for another six years, governing the two provinces on the whole wisely and well. Only after the death of Galerius in 311 did he begin preparations to assert his claim, and not until the summer of 312 did he move across the Alps against the first and most immediately dangerous of his rivals, his brother-in-law Maxentius, son of Diocletian's old colleague, the Emperor Maximian. Maximian note the 307, in 307 Constantine had put away his first wife to marry Maximian's daughter, Faustini, Faustina. Two armies met on 28th of October, 312, on the Via Flaminia, some seven or eight miles northeast of Rome, where the Tiber is crossed by the old Pont Melvio. Note the old bridge still stands. It has been restored many times, but much of its original second century fabric remains. This battle of the Milvian Bridge is principally remembered now for the legend related by Constantine's contemporary, Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea, who claims to have heard it from the emperor himself, according to which, about midday, quote, just as the sun was beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun and bearing the inscription, conquer by this. At this sight, he himself was struck with amazement and his whole army also. Note, Divita Constantini. The story is not quite as straightforward as it sounds. Another version by the scholar Lactantius, 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 
raises a number of intriguing points. I have gone into the matter a good deal more fully in Byzantium, the early centuries. Oh yeah. I've got a short history of Byzantium by also John Julius Norwich. All right. Uh, inspired, it is said, by this vision, Constantine soundly defeated the army of his brother-in-law and put it to flight, driving it southward towards the old bridge. This was extremely narrow, and Maxentius had somewhat pessimistically constructed next to it another broader one on pontoons, on which he could, if necessary, make an orderly retreat, and which could then be broken in the middle to prevent pursuit. Over this, the remains of his shattered army stampeded and all might yet have been well, had not the engineers in charge of the bridge lost their heads and drawn the bolts too soon. Suddenly the whole structure collapsed, hurtling, hurling hundreds of men into the fast flowing water. Those who had not yet crossed made wildly for the old stone bridge, but this too proved fatal. Such was its narrowness that many were crushed to death, others were trampled underfoot, still others flung down by their own comrades into the river below. Among the last was Maxentius himself, whose body was later found washed up on the bank. His severed head, impaled on a lance, was carried aloft before Constantine as he entered Rome the following day. I thought there was another little section here, but, uh, yeah. A quarter of a mile away towards Maramara stood the immense Hippodrome, the Emperor's box having direct access to the Imperial Palace behind it. All the leading cities of Europe and Asia, including Rome itself, were plundered of their finest statues, trophies, and works of art for the embezzlement and enrichment of Constantinople. At last, all was ready, and on Monday 11th, May 3, 3, 3, 0, 330, the emperor attended a mass in St. Irene, at which he formally de dedicated the city of to the Virgin. On that day, the Byzantine Empire was born. Here we go. It was therefore not in Constantinople, but in Nicomedia, that this extraordinary man, who had for years been a self-styled bishop of the Christian Church, finally received his baptism. When this ceremony was done, Eusebius tells us, he arrayed himself in imperial vestments, white and radiant as light, and laid himself down on a couch of the purest white, refusing to ever to clothe himself in purple again. Why, it may be asked, did he delay his baptism for so long? The most probable answer is also the simplest, that this sacrament conferred complete absolution from all sins, but unfortunately could be celebrated only once. It, soon, it stood to reason, therefore, that the longer it was deferred, the less opportunity there would be of failing once again into the ways of iniquity. This last supreme example of br brinkmanship was perhaps a fitting conclusion to Constantine's reign of 31 years the longest of any Roman Empire since Augustus, which ended at noon on Whit Sunday, 22 May 337. He was buried in this newly completed Church of the Holy Apostles. By virtue of his dedication, he caused 12 sarcophagi to be set up in this church like sacred pillars in honor and memory of the number of the apostles, in the center of which was placed his own, having six of their theirs on either side of it. I'm not so sure, but I almost get the feeling that this John Julius Norrie is not really a big fan of my boy Constantine.
Throughout Constantine's long advance, Maxentius had remained in Rome. Only when his brother-in-law's army was approaching the city did he march out to meet it. The two armies met on 28th of October, 312, at Saxa Rubra. The red rocks on the Via Flaminia, some seven or eight miles northeast of Rome. It was here, as later legend has it, just before or perhaps even during the battle, the Constantine experienced his famous vision as Eusebius describes it. A most marvelous sign appeared to him from heaven. And as we said before, He himself was struck with amazement, and his whole army also. Inspired by so unmistakable an indication of divine favor, Constantine rooted the army of Maxentius, driving it southward to where the Tiber, Tiber is crossed by the old Milvian Bridge. Next to this bridge, Maxentius had constructed another on pontoons. All right. There's that story again. To what extent did the vision of the cross the emperor, that the emperor is said to have experienced near the Milvian Bridge constitute not only one of the decisive turning points of his life, but also a watershed of world history? Before we can answer that question, we must ask ourselves another, what actually happened? According to the Christian scholar and rhetorician Lactantius, tutor to Constantine's son, Crispius, Crispus, Constantine was directed in a dream to cause the heavenly sign to be delineated on the shields of his shoulders and so to proceed to battle. He did as he had been commanded and he marked on their shields the letter X with the perpendicular line drawn through it and a turned around the top thus P being the cipher of Christ or Cairo. He says no more. We have no mention of a vision, only a, of a dream. There is not even any suggestion that the Savior or the cross ever appeared to the Emperor at all. As for the heavenly sign, it was simply a monogram of Chi and Rho, the first two Greek letters in the name of Christ that had long been fam a familiar symbol in Christian inscriptions, and perhaps more significant still is the fact that our other valuable source, Eusebius, makes no reference to either a dream or a vision in the account of the battle which he gives in his ecclesiastical history of about 325. It is only in his Life of Constantine, written many years later, that he produces the passage quoted above. I would say that these uh, these are very interesting books. So if you guys are interested, there is definitely a lot of information. in these here books. It's got to be put right in front of my face. There we go. That's the short history of Byzantium and the Middle Sea. Those are good books. Uh, this other book that I've been reading out of I don't know. I just picked this up at, um, you know, I, I was at a Barnes and Noble and I was like, I'm going to buy a book. And I saw this and I thought, you know what, why not check it out and see if it's any good. You know, I have a feeling it's uh, hard to find books that are in the Orthodox uh, Phronema. But I do think that there's obviously some information to be garnered from that. So I think that is it. That's all I want to share for today. So uh, hopefully this was uh, of use. I guess it's of use at least to me to uh, practice making these videos and uh, 
Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I did not mean or ever want to leave you in that room of treasure. That's what I'm going to sign out with.